Uh, my name is Doug Landman. I'm a uh, postdoc, which for those of you who don't know is basically a research scientist at the uh, Media Lab. Uh, and I'll be discussing some of the work we're doing as engineers uh, to try to advance the photographic medium. Uh, and a lot of this is really targeted more towards novices, not experts such as yourselves. And basically asking the questions of whether we can remove all the knobs on a camera so that absolutely no technical skill is required. So let me just dive in. Of course, it's overly pedantic to try to explain to those of you in the room what a camera is. Uh, I guess what I'd like to say is as an engineer, when I look at a camera, I see a device that hasn't really changed in over 100 years. Uh, based, at a very basic level, a digital, modern digital SLR is a, film, is a film camera with the film plane replaced by a, a digital sensor. And as a result, many of the classic training uh, that you would need to operate a camera hasn't changed. Uh, basically, you have a sensor, a lens, and an aperture. And you need to choose the parameters to produce a correct photographic print. And so that leads to all the technical training you might receive on choosing F numbers, exposure, depth of field, etc. Now, I think one interesting point to make here is that the cameras that we have today are really inspired by biological vision, and in particular, human vision. Why is it that we have a three-color camera? That's all a human needs to see the world. Why is it that it has one sensor, a lens, and an aperture? Well, that's pretty much what the eye has. But I think at a deeper level, a camera is a recording device. And its goal is to make a visual record of the world and ultimately to allow that record to be analyzed, modified, or displayed. And so I think to an engineer, ignoring the artistic aspects of a camera, a camera is just a communication device. And as a result, you can apply formal methods to maximize the amount of information it transmits through the world. It's a record of the past transmitted to the present or the future. And so I think even if we start with biological vision, we have to realize that nature has given us much more wonderful cameras than the human eye. We, see, we have two eyes, binocular vision, we see three color channels, and we can barely, barely perceive polarization. I highly recommend you look this up. It's called Hadinger's Brush. You can actually see the polarization on this screen once you learn how to do this trick. But more importantly, a mantis shrimp is far more impressive than our own eyes. Uh, mantis shrimp, each individual eye, each eye on a stalk here, has trinocular vision, three cameras per eye. Each eye can also see 12 colors compared to our modest three, spanning a wider range of electromagnetic spectrum. And beyond that, it can see four different states of polarization of light, and we can see none. And so I think the idea here is that we need to build cameras that far exceed biological human vision. We need to build these superhuman cameras we talked about earlier, not only to give us more power in post, but also to extend our own capabilities. And so here I'll just show you some of the work we're doing at the Media Lab as engineers to try to further this goal of building superhuman cameras. Uh, so we started about five, six years ago in a field called computational photography. And the basic theme we're using is to say, Photoshop can only take us so far. When we use software, we have certain physical limits we cannot surpass. And so really, the key idea in our group is to hack both the camera and the software together, not one uh, by itself, to, uh, to overcome traditional limitations. And so I'll just show you several projects along this theme. And so this is very indicative of work at the Media Lab. We took a camera off the shelf, ripped it apart, and what we've added right here is a ferroelectric shutter. So you can think of this as a, very, a single pixel that can be operated at high speed. Uh, the animation is missing, but what happens in this camera is when you take a single exposure, the aperture rapidly opens and closes over the exposure time, uh, thousands of times. And so you might initially think, well, that's a stupid idea. Why would I want to lose light? Well, it turns out by losing light in a careful way, you can actually gain more power in post-production. And so here is a traditional photograph. So here we have a toy train moving from right to left, very simple exposure. You press the shutter, it opens, and then it closes. And as a result, you have a motion blur. All of you have probably encountered this. You can go into Photoshop and try to de-blur, right? And so actually in the 1980s, there were many, many PhD theses going from a blurred, motion blurred image to a de-blurred photograph. But even using state-of-the-art methods, which this is, you end up with noise and ringing artifacts. And so I think what's interesting here, I, I don't have time to go into the technical depth, but by modulating the exposure thousands of times over a single exposure, we can get a photograph that still looks blurred. It's actually dimmer, so we gave up uh, some, some light. But it turns out the deblurring algorithms can do much better. And so this is the idea of computational photography. We're mucking with both the hardware itself as well as the algorithm. And it turns out the algorithms become simpler when you design the hardware properly. So that's the theme of engineering. And so then being researchers, you know, one of our main projects, uh, products besides patents are papers. You know, that's how we stake our reputation. And so as soon as we had this idea, we tried to run with it as fast as possible. And so a lot of these ideas just take a conventional camera, nothing so inspired as a mantis shrimp eye, and try playing around with different planes. So I talked about exposure. It turns out you can rip open an SLR and remove the aperture, remove the iris plane, and replace it with a printed pattern. Right? And this mask uh, actually allows you to do something very interesting. So if I take a, a camera and I focus it properly on, say, a point light source, I just see the point spread function, a nice, nice point. 
When I throw the camera out of focus, I see what's known as the circle of confusion or the bouquet of the camera. Now, I think what's interesting, uh, you could try to think to yourself, what would happen if I put this pattern into the aperture of the camera? Well, I'll show you the result. You end up getting a circle, a bouquet pattern, which is basically a scaled version of this pattern you put in the camera. And it turns out the mathematics now, instead of removing motion blur, it allows you to refocus a photo. And so here's a very poorly taken photo. Uh, and you can see that we happen to get the focus wrong. We focused on the wrong subject. In Photoshop, you'd sort of be out of luck. You'd have noise and ringing. You can't change the plane of focus after the fact very well. Well, it turns out with a coded aperture, once again, we gave up light, but we gained the ability to change the plane of focus. So you can see that the glint on the eye can be restored. Now, we, we didn't take a second photograph. This is the original photograph corrected in software by modifying the camera hardware itself. And so this theme uh, just keeps going. So this field started about 10 years ago uh, with, with light field photography, uh, and it's sort of been moving very quickly since. But the idea is that, like I said earlier, a camera for the longest time has been a sensor, a lens, and an aperture. And we're trying to break that assumption and not be inspired by biology anymore. So it turns out if you take a sensor and coat it with small lenses, or what we like to do instead is take a medium format camera and put a mask here. We love the masks for some reason. Turns out what you can do with that is instead of getting a simple photo, you actually get a four-dimensional photo. So it's like a 2D array of 2D images. Now, this is technical, but what this means is that we've eliminated one component of the camera. It turns out that a single light-filled photograph, one exposure, can be refocused to any plane. Right? So normally you have to choose the F number given the lighting conditions, but you, you give up depth of field. But now you can actually have a very large aperture, but also an extended depth of field. And so what this means is that we can now remove one component of the camera, which is the focus ring. There's no reason for autofocus to even exist now. The consumer doesn't even need to choose the plane of focus, because after the fact, they can have any one they want. And so that's sort of the theme we're going on. And that direction of research is continuing, but I think it's not very inspired to say, hey, let's just put some things in different planes of a camera. Let's just completely rethink what a camera is. And so here I'll just go very quickly, because I have the yellow light already. Uh, one thing we're doing is looking at uh, the propagation of light itself. So a normal camera, uh, when you take an exposure, it's some fraction of a second, like a thousandth, thousandth of a second, maybe up to one second. What if you could, could actually measure light on the order of billionths or trillionths of a second? And so it turns out we can do this in the laboratory. We take femtosecond lasers, which were actually used 10 years ago in chemistry to win a Nobel Prize. Now we're using femtosecond lasers to actually illuminate scenes, and we have incredibly high-speed cameras that can actually see the multiple bounces of light. So if you point one of these cameras at a door, you can actually track the light as it bounces around a room. And you can actually take a photograph of a, of a door and see what's on the other side. So you can literally see around corners with this technique. Now, it might be interesting uh, you know, to invade someone's privacy with this, but it would also be useful uh, to look at search and rescue, medical imaging applications, or safety. And so I think this is a more uh, dramatic look at what a camera could become. And so one thing that came out of all this work on cameras is we realized that the capture process has certainly uh, not evolved much in the last hundred years, but even more so, displays have barely changed, right? I mean, we still have two-dimensional displays. In fact, they've gotten worse. The dynamic range of LCDs is much worse than these beautiful prints we spoke about earlier. And so I think one thing we're also trying to do in our lab are use similar tricks to overcome limitations of display technology. And so for the students in the room, you've probably seen a lot of this already, right? Our displays are no longer passive. We can interact with them directly. We have multi-touch on the iPhone and the iPad and now the iPad 2. And also, especially for the students, we have gesture-based interfaces, like the Wii and the Microsoft Connect. Uh, so these are allowing us to interact with the photographs directly. But more importantly is we also have lighting-sensitive displays. And this is sort of a subtle point. If you take your smartphone outside, the display actually becomes brighter. And as you go into a dark room like this, it dims. And this is to save battery life. Well, we decided to try to take this idea to its logical conclusion. And again, at the Media Lab, we like ripping apart off-the-shelf stuff. And so my collaborator and I actually took uh, a bunch of LCD monitors, ripped them open, uh, did some uh, basic operations and found a very simple liquid crystal panel. And so what this lets you do is it's like a programmable overhead transparency. And it turns out if you take one of these and put a large film plane behind it, the same size as the screen, you can uh, accomplish something that 1984 said would be great, which is you can make a display that can also take a picture. And not only one picture, but actually this display becomes equivalent to an array of cameras. And so I can't go into the technical details, but it's basically a thin LCD screen like you'd have on an iPad only here we've ripped one apart and built this bite-eye screen. And this lets you do something which is sort of interesting, which is you can do multi-touch interaction. But the second your finger leaves the screen, you're tracking it in three dimensions. And so because we have multiple cameras effectively. But here you can see there actually aren't any cameras visible. And so I think this is another way the medium is changing. It's becoming highly interactive. 
Now, now that we have Microsoft Connect and iPads, this demo may not be overwhelming. This was a couple years ago before those things were out. Uh, I think one thing that is interesting that we can do is we can do relightable displays. So it's a little difficult to see, but I'm holding a flashlight, pointing it at, the, pointing it at this special LCD panel. And as I wave it around, it's measuring the real light falling on the screen and then propagating that into the virtual world, right? So imagine you have a photograph and it was taken in a dark room. Well, you actually look at the screen and you just shine a, a flashlight at the screen and it relights the photograph correctly. And so this is a, an idea of relightable photos. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm low on time, so I'll just point out all of these games we've been playing, it turns out uh, basically the, the key idea behind this is we're in, introducing masks into optical systems. And one, one thing you can do with that, uh, and it's, it's, this is pretty technical, you can make 3D displays that don't require glasses, right? So if you go to Best Buy, uh, you can, or, or you buy one of these Nintendo's 3DS that's coming out in America in March, you can see a stereoscopic image, right? Binocular stereo without glasses now, uh, but it's actually rather dim and low quality. And so we found ways to make actually 3D displays without glasses. And then we sort of, this game has just opened up a lot in the last few years. Uh, so we talked earlier about the photographic print. Uh, one thing we'd like to do is, I talked about this Bidai screen that uses LCD panels uh, to monitor the light. Uh, but we can actually make passive devices that respond to light. So we can make uh, basically a photographic print that consists of a transparency and some lenses. And it turns out that what this can do is it can react to uh, light from behind. Right? So what you can do is you can print a photograph now and put it in your windowsill. And here this is showing the time of day. And this is completely passive. There's no electronics, no power. And what happens is as the sun moves, you can see that the shadows and lighting in the photograph are correctly captured. Right, so we've changed the photographic process to record all this information, which is much more than a traditional photo. And then we've changed the print to actually allow you to view this after the fact. So it's sort of a, a, a 21st century version of stained glass. Uh, so moving ahead, if I can. There we go. Uh, so I'm low on time, so I just want to uh, show you a couple other things we've done. We talked a lot about Google and the idea of privacy and Street View. Uh, one project we had in our lab, and I'll do this very quickly, is to make a barcode that you can't perceive as a human. So here we have a small dot. It just looks like a little LED next to some large barcodes. But it turns out when you take a photograph out of focus, this dot actually becomes resolved. And you can see inside the bouquet an actual message. And so our hope is that you could, for instance, put these on the front of stores. And this could contain a small text file or information embedded in it that basically give certain permissions to the photographs taken at that location. And then, you know, if we've done a lot in this space, we have another project where we use, uh, basically it's like a hardware app store. Our idea is now that we have software app stores on phones, what you should do is you should go to CVS and buy a cheap attachment for your phone. And for instance here, by just putting a simple optical element over a smartphone, and you basically play this little video game, you get your eyeglasses prescription without a doctor, and actually more accurately than a doctor can give you. And so we're actually trying this out uh, in clinics in India right now. And so now I'd just like to very quickly uh, show you a little bit about the Media Lab and less than I planned because I've certainly taken more than enough time. Uh, so the Media Lab, if you don't know, uh, is within the School of Architecture and Planning. Despite all this engineering, it's actually in an artistic department. Uh, it has a graduate program in Media Arts and Sciences. You can see the breakdown there, but I think uh, if you enjoy this sort of mixture between hardware and software hacking and art, uh, please apply to the uh, master's program. And so I, th I think I'll leave it at that. So thank you. <laughs>